Okay, we talked about it in the lab, all right, when we were talking about the kidneys, and I want you to think of your kidneys pretty much as a big filtering system. And so now we know the components uh, of the kidneys, you know, the anatomy, uh, you know, we're dealing with our nephron, which is the actual functional filtering unit, all right, and that you have several millions of these in your kidneys, all right, so you can actually uh, filter out the fluid that will eventually become your urine. And we're going to talk about what influences, you know, the urine amount, how much is made, what's in your urine, all right, what shouldn't be in your urine, all right. Can anyone name me one thing that definitely should not be in your urine? Blood. Blood. That's right. Glucose. Did you say glucose? Did someone say glucose? Well, I was just thinking that out loud. Glucose, sugar. You don't want to have glucose in your urine. Proteins. White blood cells. Blood is bad, all right? Well, that's not really good, all right? So we're going to talk about some of that stuff here today. But you can see, look at some of the functions here, all right? Yeah, all right, we're going to get rid of, because remember, okay, your blood carries cellular waste from the metabolic processes that occur, all right? The lymphatic system picks up some of that stuff and dumps it off, all right, into the, into the blood. But it all gets filtered all right, in the kidneys, the spleen will help with some of that too, all right, but it helps with getting rid of those metabolic rates, all right. Depending on what you have in, in your ion concentration that's floating through your blood, all right, sodium levels, calcium levels, potassium levels, all right, um, uh, that is going to help, the kidney is going to play a major role in regulation of how much should be in there, okay. And then we, we'll get to this later on about acid-base balance. All right, obviously, all right, hydrogen ions are going to contribute to the acidity or the pH value. And then we've got our bicarb, which is going to contribute to our buffering system. All right, so we're going to discuss that. All right, big, big role for the kidneys is regulation of blood pressure. Probably, all right, the, the biggest influencer, all right, well, I mean, aside from heart, obviously, is that big, big role. But your kidneys play a relatively large role in influencing all right, your blood pressure, especially if you're doing damage to your kidneys, all right, through whatever reasons, if you're um, on a horrible diet, all right, certain drugs, all right, lack of certain uh, uh, substances that are required, all right, can cause damage to the kidneys. Folks that are on renal dialysis are usually going to have blood pressure issues associated with that, okay? Also, it's another way that we can get rid of certain metabolically active uh, substances, okay? Drugs. If you take drugs into your body, in most cases, they're going to be in the inactive form, and you're, you have enzymes in your body that are going to activate these drugs, all right? Some are in the liver, some are in the kidney, and some are scattered throughout, depending on, but mainly it's going to be the liver and the kidney, all right? That's going to play a big role in that, okay? We've already talked about this. Remember calcitriol? All right. You talked about it first in chapter six when you were talking about the skin, when we're talking about vitamin D. It's the active form of vitamin D, okay? So the skin produces the inactive form, all right? Then it goes into the blood, gets dumped into the liver. The liver will transform that cholecalciferol, the inactive form, into calcidiol. Then it dumps it back into the bloodstream, and then it travels to the kidneys, where the kidneys will actually activate it and turn it into calcitriol. And its purpose, what's calcitriol used for? Well, it has to do with calcium. Helps with the absorption of calcium from the digestive tract, okay, the small intestine. Okay, EPO, all right, erythropoietin, all right, when you have decreased blood oxygen levels, all right, this is the kidney's contribution to help to increase that, all right, it releases EPO, the erythropoietin, into your bloodstream and it stimulates the red bone marrow to produce more erythrocytes. So your oxygen carrying capacity increases, all right? So that's EPO for you, all right? And then on a limited basis, all right, this whole time, and I believe I said on Tuesday, Monday, excuse me, today's Wednesday. So on Monday in class, I told you that mainly gluconeogenesis is governed by the liver, all right? But in extreme cases, I won't say even extreme cases, but in specific cases, when you're in the starvation uh, situation, your kidneys can help out with all right, gluconeogenesis, all right? But primarily, gluconeogenesis is going to be the liver's responsibility, all right? But it's always good to have backup systems, all right, in case something happens to the liver. All right, 
So I want to talk about, you see these three terms up here, filtrate, tubular fluid, and then urine, all right? So those are the three names that we give the liquid, all right, or the product of whatever's being filtered in the kidney. So we assign a specific name to this fluid depending on where it is in the kidney, specifically the nephron, okay? So the first one is the filtrate, and this is basically, all right, what gets filtered at the glomerulus, okay? So you remember the glomerulus is that globular portion of these uh, capillaries, all right? They're fenestrated capillaries, which just means they've got a lot of holes in them, all right? And so blood plasma leaks out of that, all right, along with whatever's dissolved in the blood plasma, all right, and liquid, liquid uh, and water, okay? So it's going to be pretty much solutes in water that are going to be found here in the filtrate. That's what we're going to see. Water, which is primarily the majority of the makeup of our blood, okay? 92%, all right, of the blood plasma is going to be water, okay? And then solutes. Well, of course, you notice, all right, there's no formed blood elements in there. No blood, all right, no white blood cells, none of that stuff, or platelets. They're too big, okay? Okay, but if you are seeing blood, like we were talking about, like if you see blood in your urine, then you have to start to think, all right, what's going on? You have to start to think that there's an issue somewhere along the urinary system. So why not start here in the glomerulus? It's a good place to start, see what's going on, to see if there's something wrong with our filtration system, okay? So that's what we're gonna see primarily is water and solutes, all right, when we're talking about, because that's pretty much what's getting filtered, right? Because like I said, we know that blood, is made up of blood plasma, the for, and then the formed elements, okay? And so we are going to be filtering out the blood plasma, okay? And whatever comes out of those capillaries, we now call filtrate in Bowman's capsule there. That's the only time we're gonna call it that, okay? Because then, when it starts to move through the tubular system there, all right, now we call it a different name, tubular fluid, okay? And all this tubular fluid, if you look at all these um, terms here, our proximal convoluted tubule, the, the nephron loop, the distal convoluted tubule, all of this is just the pipes, okay? The piping system of the nephron, okay? So we name it after the pipes. So we call those different tubes, so we call it the, the tubular fluid, all right? And then after it arrives into the collecting ducts and is draining out of the collecting ducts, now we call it urine. Okay, and urine is pretty much that product that you are going to get rid of, all right, when you have to go potty or go to the bathroom. Okay, so now when we're dealing with urine, all right, we start to collect it in the papillary ducts. Where are those located? At the bottom of the renal papillae. Well, what's that? Remember that pyramidal structure, okay, that we see in the cortex? That's the bottom portion there. That's the renal papillae. You have these little holes here. And those are the papillary ducts, all right? And the urine pours out of that, okay? And it starts to get collected in the minor calyx. The minor calyces drain into the major calyces, and all the major calyces drain into the renal pelvis. Then the renal pelvis will drain the urine away from the kidney via the ureter into the urinary bladder. And the urinary bladder will get rid of the urine, all right, through the urethra, okay? So we've seen all that before. Okay, but just I want you to kind of be uh, uh, aware of what we call this fluid as it moves through this system here, all right? So you have three names for the fluid that's getting filtered, okay? Filtrate is just what's coming out of the glomerulus, okay? And then when we get it into the tubes and the pipes, all right, we call that the tubular fluid, all right? And then eventually, all right, when things are draining out of the collecting duct, all right, at the, and the renal papilla there, that's when we start to call it urine. And then from that point on, it's urine the rest of the way, okay? So this picture here is a really helpful picture. I like it in your book. It's figure 24-9, all right? Tough to read. We'll zoom in. And this kind of gives us, all right, the only time that we call the fluid filtrate is here, right there, okay? Easy to remember. And then we have all of our pipes here and tubes and whatnot. So at that point, all throughout this area here, all right, we call it tubular fluid. All right, makes sense. It's going through the tubular system here. Okay, then it starts to drain out, all right, through the papillary duct here and the renal papillae. 
all right? And then we start to call it urine. And then from there, all right, these papillae will draw, drain into, all right, the minor calyces, the minor calyces drain into the major calyces and then into the renal pelvis and then so forth, down in the ureter, here into the, into the urinary bladder, then out through the urethra, okay? So pretty much from the papillary duct, which are these holes here, all right, that is going to be referred, that fluid is referred to as urine. And that's pretty much what, there's not gonna be really any changes to that fluid anymore, okay? All right, questions? Okay, so I go camping, I like to go camping, I bring a water purifier with me. It's important to have a good water purifier in case you use up all your water, okay? And so the water purifiers are really important be, uh, to, to, to be in good working order, just like your kidneys are, okay? And water purifiers are filters, okay? So there's a lot of things that occur during the filtering process. So I want you to think of it like that. I mean, I could literally, I had this top notch, it was the best of the best uh, filters, water purifiers. You just stuck one hose into ideally running water, okay? And then you had this pump and you could pump it and then at the other end of the hose, at the other end of the pump, you had a hose that you could put into the bottle to drink. All right, so ideally whatever was coming in, by the time it worked its way through the system was good enough to drink, all right? We're gonna see some, I'm not saying you should be drinking your urine. You can drink your urine, all right? I don't advise it, all right? Unless you're in the middle of the ocean. All right, I believe you can drink your urine. Does anyone know how many times? I've heard twice, all right? I don't wanna drink it once, all right? But if you're on a boat in the middle of a salt water ocean, you gotta do what you gotta do, okay? Point being is, in this filter that I'm using, it's clearing all this stuff out. All right, that's what we're going to see with the kidneys. We are going to see how the kidneys, all right, are going to clear everything out of that fluid and then wind up with, all right, urine. That's going to be, all right, our overall end product through the kidneys, all right, and doing what they're supposed to be doing, okay? So there's three processes that we're going to talk about. Filtration, all right, resorption, and secretion. Okay, so here's basically, I'm gonna come right back, I promise you, don't forget. I love this picture, you know me, I love pictures. All right, so here are those three processes again. Here's filtration, here's resorption, and here's secretion, okay? So basically, filtration is going to be, here's your capillaries, your blood system, all right? Blood is coming into the glomerulus, okay? It leaves the glomerulus, your glomerulus, all right, not the blood, but the fluid, all right, the filtrate leaves the glomerulus and enters into our tubular system. That first part is the filtration, okay? So that's pretty much water and solutes. We'll talk about what include, what's included in all the solutes here, all right? Then we start to move through our tubular system. In that time, okay, we're going to see a lot of what was filtered out is going to get resorbed back into the bloodstream. And that's okay, that's good. You're gonna see pretty much all the water, all the glucose, okay, because glucose does leave the blood here, all right? But ideally, we wanna resorb all the glucose. You don't wanna have glucose in your urine as long as your blood sugar levels are appropriate, okay? And then near the end, we'll start to see as we move through here, we're gonna see, all right, how certain products, all right, solute substances will move back from the blood back into our tubular system. All right, so we're gonna go through all those processes here, okay? But the three main processes are going to be, all right, filtration, resorption, and secretion, okay? So filtration is easy. That happens in the glomerulus, all right? So the glomerular capillaries, again, think of them as leaky pipes, okay? So what will leave through there is going to be water and whatever was dissolved in the blood plasma. If it's small, if it's small, okay, certain things are pretty big and we don't want them to leave. You don't want your red blood cells leaving. You don't want your white blood cells leaving and the platelets leaving. You don't even want proteins if you can help it to leave, okay? But there's different sizes of proteins. You have small, intermediate, and large proteins. So large proteins should not be leaving, okay? Some intermediate may leave, okay? And small will usually leave, okay? 
So this is what we're going to see. We're going to see the water and those solutes, they're going to go into that capsular space, that Bowman space there, in between the capillaries and the actual uh, capsular uh, 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 shell there, okay? And so what we'll see is, depending on, all right, remember when we were talking about the circulatory system when we talked about bulk flow? I don't know if you remember that term when I talked about hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure. Remember the push-pull forces? Hydrostatic is the push, all right, and the oncotic is the pull, okay? So we're going to visit some of that again. So you already have an idea, I hope, and you still kind of retain some of that information, all right, when we talk about bulk flow, okay? But whatever fluid that comes out of these glomerular capillaries, we call that filtrate, okay? All right, so we're going to talk about what will influence how much of the filtrate is generated, okay, and what helps to increase and decrease and all that fun stuff. All right, so the second step is the tubular resorption, okay? So we're going to have these substances moving through our tubular system, all right? And ideally, all right, we'll see the movement of the tubular fluid from our nephron tubular system back into the blood. And these are the three processes that we will uh, witness. Diffusion and osmosis. Remember, those are both passive processes. They do not, I repeat, they do not require energy, okay? But they do require the movement of substances down their concentration gradient. You remember that, right? Diffusion, all right, when, with sodium entering into a cell, okay? It's moving down its concentration gradient. Osmosis has to do with the movement of water, okay? Water will also move down its concentration gradient. It'll go from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water. But also keep in mind with osmosis, I've said this before, water will also move to the area that has the higher solute concentration, okay? Which is going to be the area that has the lower water concentration. Okay, so you can think of it as that also. Water is going to move to the area with higher solute concentration. So you can kind of think of the solutes as kind of pulling the water towards it, all right? So these substances are going to return to our peritubular capillaries and the vasa recta. Remember, the peritubular capillaries are those capillaries that, are, that we find all around all right, the tubular system, okay? And then your vasa recta is going to be where we find the capillaries along the um, nephron loop, okay? So pretty much our whole tubular system has these two capillary systems in close proximity. So we're going to see the movement of substances, and we'll talk about what influences the movement of those substances, okay? But keep in mind, all right, when we're talking about tubular resorption, all right, all of what we consider to be vital products or substances are going to be put back into the blood. Okay, water is vital. We need it, okay? And especially if you are in a dehydrated state, you better believe we're going to be sucking all that water out of that tubular fluid as much as we can get, okay? Glucose, all right, also vital, all right? We like to use it for energy. We're going to suck all that out of there too. Sodium, same thing. We'll talk about it. We'll walk through these, okay? But if you're in a situation where you have a lot, like an excess, all right, for example, diabetics, they have an excess of, of glucose floating around their blood. Why? Because they don't have insulin, all right, to help put it away, okay? So their blood sugar levels are high, okay? And we'll talk about what uh, you, the values that will influence that, all right? But so what does your kidneys do? They get rid of the extra glucose, okay? It, 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 it resorbs as much as it can, you know, but sometimes if it's more than, well, 375 all right, milligrams, if, usually that's how much it can uh, resorb, but if you have like 500 milligrams of, of glucose floating around in your blood, it can't handle all that, all right? So what happens? You pee it out, okay? So we'll talk about that. All right, and the last one, our tubular secretion. All right, tubular secretion is active transport. That means we are going to be utilizing energy, okay? Energy will be applied, ATP, okay? So this is what happens when we move stuff out of the peritubular capillaries in the vasorecta, 
back into the tubular system. Okay? We're going to move it back in. And then eventually we're going to excrete that material. Okay? So those are our three processes, filtration, resorption, secretion. Right, so we're going to work our way through and talk about each of those segments and what's happening there. All right, we won't get it all done today, but we'll get a lot of it done. Okay? So let's start off with the beginning part of our structure, all right, of the nephron. And that's going to be the glomerulus, okay? Our filter. Let's talk about our filter. So this is an important um, point right here, all right? When you have, want a good filter, you want it to be thin, all right? Simple, uh, uh, simple epithelium is great for filtering. That's, in fact, one of its functions, all right? So simple epithelium is a great filter. So we want, and simple epithelium is thin, all right? Well, guess what? So is the membrane, all right, from our, for our glomerulus. It's going to be thin. Obviously, porous, okay? You got to have holes in it. We want to have leaky pipes. And this is important, too, negatively charged structure, all right? Remember what charges do. If they're light charges, they repel each other. If they're opposite, they're attracted. Well, guess what? Proteins have a negative charge, okay? If this filter membrane is negatively charged, it will repel the proteins. It'll keep the proteins from being filtered out, which is good. We don't want that, all right? So that's one of the additional attributes that we get, all right, for making this a good membrane to filter things through, that it's negatively charged, and anything that has a negative charge to it all right, gets repelled away and has a less likely chance of being filtered, okay? So when we talk about our filtration membrane, we're going to be including the glomerulus, all right, which is going to be the capillaries, all right, and then the visceral layer of the glomerular capsule. Because remember, the glomerular capsule has a visceral and a parietal layer. The visceral layer is the, is the layer that does the filtration process. The parietal layer is impenetrable, right? It's impermeable. Right? Nothing leaks out of that. So if we're looking here, here's our glomerular capsule. Okay, this is a horrible drawing, but this is what, you're, this is what I'm talking about. So the visceral layer is this part. The parietal layer is this part. Okay, so that's good. We want stuff to leak into here, and then it goes there into our tubular system. Okay, so... Our layers involve the endothelium of the glomerulus. That's the, capsular or the, the uh, capillary layer, all right? Endothelium is going to be simple squamous epithelium, all right? And in this case, it's fenestrated. Remember, if you remember, we talked about three types of capillaries. You've got continuous capillaries, which there's no holes or anything. You have fenestrated capillaries, which are a capillary that looks like this, all right? You can see this capillary, how it has, how it has all these holes. Those are the fenestrated. And then the third type of capillary, all right, is the sinusoid one, all right? And it has these big, long, jagged holes in it. So a lot more stuff can leak through the sinusoid capillaries, okay? But here in the kidneys, we're dealing with the fenestrated. We have these smaller holes there, okay? <clears throat> all right, so purpose of this, all right, is to prevent the passage of big things, Red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, large proteins. We want to keep those in the blood. We don't want those filtering out. Okay? So large structures are going to be prevented from crossing over our filter simply by the endothelium. Okay. So there's another layer to this. All right. Now we have the basement membrane. Because remember, all right, epithelium sits on a basement membrane. Well, guess what? Those are glycoproteins and proteoglycan molecules. Don't expect you to know this. But these two structures are negatively charged. That's what defers the negative charge right, to our filter. Okay, so that's good. They prevent all right, proteins, hopefully, all right, from passing through. You can't help it if some small ones get through. Okay? But this keeps those larger plasma proteins in their place. Because remember, proteins in our blood plasma give, or when we're talking about bulk flow, if you remember, the oncotic pressure, all right, that's that attractive pulling pressure that proteins exert on substances in the blood, okay? You have the hydrostatic pressure that's pushing, all right, fluid out of capillaries, but the oncotic or osmotic colloid pressure helps to pull things back into the blood, 
All right? So it's these proteins that exert that. So if we start to lose those proteins, then our oncotic colloid pressure decreases. All right? And then you can get more stuff leaking out of your blood that you don't want to be leaking out. All right? That's why people with liver disease, all right, have an issue making albumin. Albumin is a huge protein made by the liver, all right, and folks with liver disease will complain of edema. They'll get edema in their legs, and it's because they don't make the albumin protein as well. They have less of it, and stuff leaks out of their blood vessels into the interstitial uh, tissue, and that's not good. <clears throat> all right, the last layer is going to be uh, that visceral layer here. All right, now the visceral layer has got these special cells here called podocytes, all right? And so they're, I'm um, trying to think of a cell that's similar to it. I really don't have one, but let me just show you a picture that comes to mind. This is a podocyte, all right? So here you can see the podocyte, and it's got these, these um, uh, extensions, these processes that come off, all right? And then these processes have these even smaller processes, all right? called pedicels, and they help to make these slits here, okay? These slits are on the, just on the other side of the basement membrane. But again, it's another place where we can get filtration of substances to occur, right? And these filtration slips, slits, excuse me, can become bigger or smaller depending on what the podocytes do. And this other cell, that's found in that area called mesangial cells, okay? But these podocytes play a big role in, in um, the structuring of these filtration slits, all right? And these filtration slits will prevent the passage of small proteins, okay? So you can see, we really want to keep our proteins in the blood. We don't want them getting out. And I'm going to show you a picture here in a second that's going to uh, help you to, to visualize that, okay? All right, so these mesangial cells here, all right, we're going to see these guys, all right, in our filtration membrane, all right, and they play a couple different roles. The most important role that they play is this function or this characteristic. Yeah, it's, an, it's nice that they're phagocytic. It's good because they can help to break down substances that may have gotten somewhere that they shouldn't be, all right, or if you run into a situation where there's an infection, all right. But the fact that they're contractile is going to influence this, the size of the filtration slits. We'll talk about that, all right? ANP, I don't know if you remember ANP, atriatic, uh, natriuretic peptide. Remember is that hormone that the atria produce when your blood pressure increases, all right? Because it puts more stretch on the atrial walls, all right? We'll talk about this later on. It's gonna affect the mesangial cells. Okay, especially their contractile characteristic. It's going to influence some things. All right, so going to this picture here, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a nice cross section of our filtration membrane here. Okay, now before I do that, let me just zoom in here so you kind of get a nice look here. All right, here's our capillary. Here's the lumen for the capillary. So you can see this first inner red layer. All right, that's the endothelium. Okay, you can see how it's got all these holes in it. All right, those are those fenestrations. It makes it leaky. Then just on top of that, this is the basement membrane. Okay, that's those glycoproteins and those proteoglycans. All right, they defer that negative charge to our membrane. And then just on the other side of it, here you can see the pedicels here. All right, and those are those processes that come off the podocytes. All right, so that gives us those filtration slits. So now we're just going to take a cut right through all that. All right, do a nice cross section. So we can kind of show you the uh, membrane, all right, on a sagittal or cross-sectional cut, okay? So here's your blood vessel here. Here's the capillary, okay? And you can see all these large structures, these foreign blood elements, they should not be, le look, how, look how small these little uh, filtration holes are. They're not big. So you can see that's a big problem if you're getting blood in your urine, all right? Something's bad. Something bad's going on. Okay. So anyways, the foreign blood elements will stay in the capillaries, okay, all the cells. But you can see even the large proteins are, are too big. They should not be leaking out. Now, some of our smaller ones can sneak through, okay? So they got to get through, 
All right, the fenestrations, not too hard for a small protein. All right, the hard part for those small proteins is going to be to try to get by, all right, the basement membrane here with the negative charge, and then also these filtration uh, uh, slits here. Okay, and again, we can influence the size of these slits, all right, through certain hormones, and we'll talk about some of the other uh, processes that help to influence that. But if you see here, look what we can filter out just on its own. When everything's normal, everything's good, water flows right across easily. Glucose, no problem. You know how small amino acids are? They're tiny, all right? They're a couple carbons big, all right? Ions, well, we know sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphate, those are all small. So they can go right across. So a lot of this stuff will flow right across, no problem. And it's designed to do that, okay? Because guess what we're doing? When we are getting rid of a lot of water right, in the filtrate, guess what the blood is looking like? We're dehydrating the blood, so to speak. Okay, So we're actually going to be increasing the oncotic pressure in the blood Okay, because we're filtering out these items here, but what's left behind all right, if the proteins are remaining and there's less fluid, we're going to increase the oncotic pressure and it's going to create more of a pull in that blood uh, vessel later on when we get to the peritubular uh, capillaries and the vasa recta. Uh, and it'll make more sense to you when I get to that part. All right, so you can see here all that stuff that's getting pulled out, or not pulled out, actually literally pushed out, okay, because it's getting filtered out. All right, so that's going to wind up in our capsular space here. Okay. So now we're gonna go through, you've seen the first part here, all right, our filtration membrane. So now we're gonna talk about how we're gonna form that, all right? We're gonna see, all right, how much and what is being put into the filtrate specifically. Check this out, 180 liters of filtrate is formed a day, a day. Go to your grocery store, look on the shelves, 180 liters, that's a lot. That's what your kidneys are doing all day long, every day. All right, they're pumping that out, okay? So basically, your filtrate is just filtered blood plasma, okay? Filtered blood plasma. So yeah, it's gonna have certain solutes, or right? we're not gonna get all the solutes from the blood. Our large proteins, hopefully all of our proteins will stay in the blood, okay? But that's not always the case, okay? So our filtrate forms in the capsular space or Bowman space, and then it moves into the PCT proximal convoluted tubule, okay? A lot of stuff happens here, okay? Keep in mind, what doesn't leave, all right? The glomerulus, blood, all right? The blood formed elements, okay? All right, questions so far? Okay. So let's see what gets filtered and what doesn't get filtered. Do you think water gets, uh, do you think that water can freely flow across the plasma membrane or the filtration membrane? Yeah, water can. Do you think a red blood cell can? No. Okay. I want to make sure that I kind of hit that pretty, pretty hard. How about a large protein? Yeah, like a protein that's 400 amino acids big. No. Okay. That will not go. All right. So now we're going to show you what can go freely, what can't go freely, and what can, in some cases, be filtered, all right? So anything that's small, obviously. Remember, what are the two characteristics for something to diffuse directly through the plasma membrane? What does a, a molecule need to have? What properties does it need to possess to flow directly through a plasma membrane? Exactly, small and nonpolar. So, this has to be small. So anything that's really small, so anything that can diffuse through a plasma membrane, you better believe it can move, all right, that it, you better believe it's freely filtered, all right? So water, all right, is going to be there, glucose, amino acids, and ions, all right? All of those are gonna just pass on through, okay, by design, by design, all right? Things that we can't, any of the blood formed elements, and obviously large proteins, okay? So those will not be. All right, now, limited filtration, intermediate size proteins, all right, but again, it's difficult for them to get through because of the negative charge that we've set up, 
All right, proteins are negative charged. Okay, so light charges repel each other. Okay, so it'll try its hardest unless there's a lot of protein in your blood. All right, then you can't control all of that. Okay, but usually that will be blocked from crossing over the plasma membrane there. <clears throat> all right, so you probably thought that you could get away from bulk flow. Okay, so we're going to discuss the bulk flow, hydrostatic pressure. All right, and then our osmotic pressure. All right, except here it's going to be a little bit simpler, and this is going to be something that you need to know, all right, for your exam. All right, this is one of those equations here that we're going to run into. All right, so let's start off by talking about our glomerular hydrostatic pressure, okay, which is essentially, all right, the pressure of the circulatory blood system, all right, in our renal corpuscle there. Okay, so that's going to be the blood. So we represent it as HP, hydrostatic pressure, G for the glomerulus here. Okay, so this is your blood pressure inside of those capillaries. Okay, so again, hydrostatic pressure is the push force pressure. Okay, so what's it going to do? It's going to push stuff out of the capillaries. What's it pushing out? Water and some solutes. Okay, and where's it going to go? It's going to go... It's going to wind up in the capsular space there, okay? So interesting enough, the blood pressure in the glomerulus, in those blood capillaries there, is going to be higher than other capillary beds that we've seen throughout the body, like around muscles or certain tissues here. Do you know why? Right here. Part of it is because of this, the fact that that the afferent arterial is larger than the efferent arterial. So it's going to look like something like this. Here's a big blood vessel, and then you got this glomerulus here, and then it gets small. Okay? So what do we know about the diameter of blood vessels? If it's a big diameter versus a small diameter, is it a small diameter gives more what when we're talking about blood pressure? Resistance, resistance. So by design, all right, we have now increased the resistance here, all right, just by design in a normal person, okay, which increases the pressure in here, okay? So that's going to increase the pressure, which means it's going to force stuff out, all right? So that's okay. That's what we want. That's what we want, all right? So that, because you want to have increased pressure on the inside compared to on the outside. Because if the pressure is higher here, it's gonna prevent stuff from leaving, okay? So we wanna have the hydrostatic pressure inside of our glomerulus to be higher than the pressure outside the glomerulus, all right? That's gonna promote flow, all right, from the glomerulus into the capsular space. It's essential, you need to have that, okay? This is a filter. Filter's not going to do you any good if you can't filter anything because none of the fluid moves anywhere. Okay? All right. So that's one part of our bulk flow equation. All right? The other part are going to be these two guys. Okay? These are going to be, these two values are going to be the pressures that oppose the hydrostatic pressure of the glomerulus. Okay? So one is, all right, the colloid osmotic pressure or the oncotic pressure. And that's due to plasma proteins. Okay, remember, that's the pulling force. That's going to keep stuff from leaving the blood. Okay? So the plasma proteins and some other substances, say we have sodium floating around in there, a lot of glucose. because glu Remember, water is, the is a follower. Right? Water likes to follow salts, likes to follow glucose. Hence, that's why if you're peeing uh, uh, glucose out in your urine, you always have to pee all the time because the water follows it out. Okay, and we'll talk more about that too. Okay, so the osmotic pressure, all right, is going to be that pressure, all right, in the glomerulus, but, but it's going to be the, the, a pulling force. It's going to pull things back in or try to prevent things from leaving. All right, so think of it as it's going to draw the fluid back into the glomerulus there. Okay, the other force that's going to oppose filtration is that pressure on the outside of the glomerulus. That's called the capsular hydrostatic pressure. Okay, that's outside the glomerulus, all right? So as 
fluid leaves the glomerulus and goes into that capsular space, all right, we're going to start to get an accumulation of fluid there. Okay? If that fluid's not being drained off into the proximal convoluted tubule and it stays there, then that pressure increases there, and that's going to cause more opposition to the hydrostatic pressure inside the glomerulus there. Okay? So that will prevent the movement of fluid leaving the glomerulus and going into the capsular space. We can't have that. Okay? All right. So, of course, here's an equation for you. Here you go. This is your net filtration pressure equation. Okay? So, that's basically what I just said. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the pressure inside the glomerulus and we're going to subtract, all right, the two pressures that oppose the hydrostatic pressure inside the glomerulus. All right, our oncotic pressure in the glomerulus, all the proteins and dissolved substances there. And then also the hydrostatic pressure outside the glomerulus. And we're going to add those two opposition uh, pressures together, and then we're going to subtract it from the hydrostatic pressure of the glomerulus. If it's a positive number, then what we, we're going to see is we're going to see we're going to favor filtration. If it's a negative, all right, it's not favoring filtration. All right, so the example here, 60 mil. Well, let me use the picture because it's the same thing. Here you go. All right, so the hydrostatic pressure inside of our glomerulus all right, is going to be 60 millimeters of mercury. Okay, pretty decent. Then we've calculated the oncotic or osmotic pressure all right, inside the glomerulus due to all the dissolved substances, all right, uh, plasma proteins and whatnot. All right, and we come up with 32 all right, millimeters of mercury. And then the hydrostatic pressure out here in the capsular space is 18. So we add the two opposing forces or pressures together. That gives us 50. We take the difference, all right? So we subtract the 50 from 60, and we have 10 millimeters of mercury. It's a positive number. It favors filtration. That means we are moving our filtrate out and into the proximal convoluted tubule. If it was a negative number, we would not be getting filtration. Do you all see that? Okay. Just keep in mind, this number, the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus, has to be larger than the sum of both of these values here. Because these two values, the blood colloid osmotic pressure and the capsular hydrostatic pressure, are both going to oppose the glomerular hydrostatic pressure. Okay? So the net calculation, if it's positive, then our filtrate is going out. If it's negative, it is not going out. Okay? You need to know that value or that equation. Okay? Right there. <clears throat> Questions so far? Okay. <clears throat> so there's a value that we're going to be talking quite a bit about. Okay? We talked about just melt net filtration pressure to see if stuff if our filtrate is moving out of the glomerulus or not moving out of the glomerulus but i want to talk about this next um, topic glomerular filtration rate so this is a, a a value that we use to determine pretty much how well your kidneys are functioning all right gives us an idea all right as to what's going on here all right so we're going to see all right, what is going to influence our glomerular filtration rate? First of all, what is it? It's pretty much over the period of one minute how much filtrate we make in a minute, okay? So how much is formed? So we're going to talk about now what's going to influence that, okay? Part of that is going to be the net filtration, all right? So if we increase our net filtration, all right, that means more filtrate is going to be pouring out of the capillaries. It only makes sense that that's going to increase glomerular filtration rate, okay, because we're going to form more of it over that period of a minute. So if we increase the net filtration pressure, we increase the net 
glomerular filtration rate. Can we all agree on that? Make sense? Cool. All right. So what else, all right, can influence this? We'll check it out. If we increase our solutes in the water here, all right, that also is going to increase, all right, the filtration rate because if it's definitely solutes, all right, that's going to create an osmotic pressure and it's going to pull more things out, okay? So we're going to see that, okay? If we increase our net filtration rate, we are going to see water being pushed out more and more solutes. Now, here's the issue though, all right? When we have an increased net filtration pressure, we will see a decreased filtrate resorption. And I look at it like this. If you drink a lot of water, which I've been doing all day long, I'm telling you this is the perfect day to be teaching this because I have not lying to you. I've probably peed about 10 times since noon today. I don't know why. I'm worried about my kidneys, but I've been drinking a lot of water because I'm thirsty. But what's going on is when you drink the water, all right, it gets absorbed all right, into your body tissues. Part of that, all right, uh, when we're talking about the absorption of water, it's going to go into your blood. All right? Increased water in the blood increases blood volume. Increase in blood volume causes an increase in blood pressure. So we increase our blood pressure. Eventually, if we increase our blood pressure, we're going to increase the net filtration pressure. More water in the blood and it's going to get pushed out into the kidneys, right? You know this. We all know this because when we drink a lot of water, we pee more. And that's in healthy individuals, always healthy individuals, okay? So that's what's going to happen here, okay? So I'm going to be, I'm, I'm drinking more water. I'm increasing my net filtration pressure. Bless you. I'm increasing the glomerular filtration rate because I'm pushing more water out of the glomerulus, right? But what I'm going to see is I'm going to resorb less of that water, okay? Because all the other tissues are satisfied. I'm not in a dehydrated state. I don't need to keep that water. So I'm going to decrease, all right, the amount of water in the filtrate, all right? Oh, and to do that, I'm going to decrease the resorption rate, all right? So we'll talk about some of those um, situations here, all right? Well, I already talked about the hydration status. That's basically what I was saying when we're talking about urine production here. Okay. So we're going to now discuss how the kidney, all right, is going to affect, all right, your overall glomerular filtration rate, all right? So what things does the kidney, all right, because we always want to keep it, well, there's two things we want to do with the glomerular filtration rate. We always want to maintain it. We want to keep it within normal values, all right? But there's going to be certain situations, all right, in which when that glomerular filtration rate gets swung, in one direction or the other. If it increases significantly or decreases significantly, then we gotta change it and reverse it through the negative feedback system, all right? But we always wanna keep, remember homeostasis, we wanna keep everything in a certain range, all right? And there's two ways that we're gonna deal with this, all right? We're gonna deal with the intrinsic controls and the ends extrinsic controls. Intrinsic, we keep everything in house. The kidney's gonna take care of the problem all by itself, all right? The extrinsic controls are going to be these factors that are going to, in, these outside factors that are going to influence the kidneys. Hormones, hormones, all right? Aldosterone, all right? ANF, okay? So we're going to talk about some of those, all right? So when we talk about the glomerular filtration rate, all right, we're going to deal with these two factors here. One, the diameter of the afferent arterial, okay? How big that thing is going to be that leads into the glomerulus, and two, all right, the surface area of our filtration membrane, okay? Because remember, I said that we can change, all right, those filtration slits, and there's a way to do that, and we're gonna get into that now, okay? So when we're gonna deal with glomerular filtration rate, all right, we can do it two ways here. We can change the diameter of the afferent arterial, how big or how small we want that to be, and then we can also change how big or how small those filtration slits are going to be in our filtering membrane, okay? All right, so let's talk about the intrinsic controls first, our autoregulation, okay? This is a key word here, maintain, okay? So when we talk about the renal autoregulation, 
the kidney itself has these controls in place to main train, excuse me, maintain a constant and consistent, all right, blood pressure, all right, within the kidney itself and maintain that constant and consistent glomerular filtration rate, okay? This is important, why? Because outside of the kidney, your blood pressure could be doing all sorts of things, all right? But the kidney wants to keep things cool and copacetic inside, all right? So despite whatever happens in your systemic arterial pressure, all right, your blood pressure, the kidney is going to try to maintain its own stable environment, okay? So we're going to talk about that. These are the intrinsic controls, okay? So we have two mechanisms that are going to do this. The first one is what we call the myogenic response. Myo, think muscles, okay? We're not dealing with skeletal muscles with the kidney. We're going to deal with smooth muscles. And so far, the only smooth muscles that we know that are in existence inside of our kidney are the smooth muscles in the blood vessels, okay? So this is gonna have to do with the smooth muscles of the blood vessels. And then the other one is the tubular glomerular feedback mechanism, okay? So we'll start off with the easy one first, the myogenic response one, right? And it's real simple. It all has to do with what the smooth muscle cells, all right, are doing inside the afferent arterial in response to stretch. Well, what stretches the arterial? Pressure. So if we increase the pressure, we're gonna increase the stretch. If we decrease the pressure, we're gonna decrease the stretch, okay? So it's based on that, all right? So what is going on with the smooth muscles? And then what are the smooth muscles gonna do? So our stimulus is an increase or decrease in pressure, all right? And then our response is going to be, all right, whether or not the smooth muscles contract or relax. Okay, so let's look at our first example. We get a decreased blood pressure, okay? The blood pressure that's coming into the afferent arterial is decreased, okay? So that means the stretch on the walls of the afferent arterial decrease, all right? So this is what's gonna happen, all right? So now we see the smooth muscle cells are going to relax, because remember, remember, if our blood pressure decreases, all right? The kidney wants to keep everything constant inside. Okay, so our systemic blood pressure decreases, right? The kidney wants to maintain, all right, that pressure inside the glomerulus at a certain value, all right? So in order to do that, it needs to, even though you might be losing blood pressure in your hands, in your head, in your legs, the kidneys want to keep the blood the same level, inside the glomerulus. How does it do that? It increases the flow. How does it do that? It causes vasodilation of the afferent arterial, right, which allows more blood to flow into the glomerulus, okay? And that's what we see here. So the more blood that enters into the glomerulus here, all right, it's going to maintain that proper pressure, right, and that's how it compensates for the low blood pressure throughout your, your blood pressure system here, all right? GFR remains normal. That's what we want. We always want it to be normal. So I should have showed you this first, but let me just do this other example here, and then I'll show you the picture. All right, now we get an increased blood pressure. You had a salty meal, all right? You got a lot of salt, a lot of water, like myself. I'm drinking a lot of water. So now my blood pressure increases, causes more stretch on the blood vessel walls, okay? So the more stretch is going to cause the smooth muscle cells to immediately contract. We get vasoconstriction that decreases the amount of blood that is flowing into the glomerulus, all right? Again, all right, it's going to maintain that constant and consistent glomerular filtration because we want that specific number to stay the same, all right? And this is how we compensate for that increase in systemic blood pressure. So if you've got your book handy, all right, I recommend 2413 is the figure. This explains it really well. So let's look at a normal situation here. I'm going to blow this up like that. All right, so normal blood pressure, okay? Everything 
Normal blood pressure, 120 over 80, let's say. Okay, so blood's flowing in nicely. All right, coming into the afferent arterial. It's getting filtered out. Everything's good. Okay? So now your blood pressure drops for whatever reason. Okay? You're bleeding out. I don't want to say bleeding out. That makes it sound bad. You're just, you're bleeding. All right? Nothing fatal, but you're bleeding. All right? To maintain the constant glomerular filtration rate that we want to do, we need to get more blood to come in here because your systemic blood pressure is decreased. Okay, so how do we do that? We vasodilate the afferent arterial, all right, and that keeps the concentrate, the, not the concentration, but the blood pressure in here consistent so we can maintain that consistent and constant filtration rate. Okay, and then if your blood pressure jumps up too high, then we get vasoconstriction here in the afferent arterial. Okay, so we decrease the flow slightly. Right, still wanting to have that maintain filtration uh, rate constant there. All right, so that's the myogenic response. The tubular glomerular response, all right, this is what we're going to see when we're dealing with increased blood pressure here, okay? And of course, we're going to deal with one of our favorites, all right, sodium chloride, salt, okay? So what's going to happen is we're going to filter out and we're going to see an accumulation of sodium chloride in the tubular fluid there. Well, guess what? Remember what I said? Who's the follower? Water. Water is the follower to salt. All right. And what we'll see here, all right, is we're going to see a movement of more water out. All right. This is sensed by the macular dental cells. What are those? These guys, right here. These guys right here, over here. Okay, these cells here will monitor that. All right, and what will happen is, all right, we will start to see vasoconstriction of the afferent arterial. All right, and this is after the myogenic response, okay? After the myogenic response. We can only vasoconstrict and vasodilate so much. What um, influences, uh, how do I wanna say this? Uh, all right, this is an easy one. What aspect or what part of the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system influences blood vessel diameter? I'll make it a little bit more clear. Which division of the autonomic nervous system influences the blood vessel diameter? Sympathetic. Yeah, it's not dual innervation when it comes to blood vessel diameter, okay? So keep that in mind, all right? We have, the term is called autonomic tone. And basically autonomic tone is the sympathetic nervous system, the neurons that are continually releasing their neurotransmitter. And it keeps that continual release of the neurotransmitter will keep those blood vessels in a partially constricted state, okay? So that gives you two options, that, that concept there, okay? Because we're dealing with just one division of the autonomic nervous system that influences the diameter, so, and it's partially constricted. So we have two options. We can either constrict it more and make the diameter smaller, or we can dilate it and make the diameter bigger, okay? And that will influence the amount of blood flow that will occur, okay? So that's what we're going to see here. <clears throat> okay. So one of the things that you should understand when we're talking about regulating the glomerular filtration rate is, is that there are certain limitations in this scenario because you can only vasoconstrict or vasodilate these blood vessels so much. And so we will reach that point where we can't vasodilate anything more than what it can give us. All right? So when we deal, when we deal with the autoregulation, all right, when the values of our blood pressure are between 80 to 180 milligrams, all right, we're going to be able to auto-regulate, all right, the, the, the amount of glom the, the glomerular filtration right here, okay? So as long as, all right, the mean arterial pressure is within these values, and in case you're not sure what mean, are, does anyone remember how to calculate mean arterial pressure? <laughs> 
Yeah, you nailed that. That's very close. Yeah, MAP is equal to uh, one third of the difference of your systolic minus the diastolic. All right. Uh, where am I writing that out? Uh, minus diastolic. There's another way to, to, I won't type the whole thing out. No, that's one half. I'm sorry. One third, one third. My bad, my bad. Okay. Oh, no, not minus. Sorry. At, 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 at. Okay. So that's the mean arterial pressure. That's what MAP is. Okay. Whoops. Don't want that. Pulse pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pulse pressure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So point being is as long as it's in these values here, the renal autoregulation can handle it. Okay. No problems. But now if we bottom out, all right, and your blood pressure goes below 80, goes down into the 50s or whatever, all right, the arterials, like I said, they can only dilate so much, all right? And so we are going to decrease the glomerular filtration rate as much as we can. Now again, we're always trying to maintain a specific glomerular filtration rate. So what we're going to talk about here in a few moments is what happens when we can't maintain. This is our nice maintenance here. All right, we're going to talk about what happens when we can't maintain, all right, that consistent and constant glomerular filtration rate, okay? How do we do that? It's going to affect how much urine we are going to either retain or get rid of, okay? So if the blood pressure drops down really low, all right, our urine levels are going to get really low, okay? If our blood pressure gets really high, above 180 here, we can, again, only constrict those blood uh, vessels so much, okay? Then we're going to increase our urine formation because why? We're going to try to decrease our blood volume, okay? And we're going to talk about that. All right, questions about anything so far? All right, so let's talk about the extrinsic controls. What stuff, and we've talked about some of this already when we talked about the endocrine system, all right? You remember aldosterone and all that fun stuff and, and, and ANF and all that, okay? We're gonna talk about some of our extrinsic. So mind you, the intrinsic, the autoregulation maintains glomerular, glomerular, glomerular filtration rate, all right? Extrinsic is going to be what happens when we can't maintain the glomerular filtration rate, all right? And it changes, all right? So that's pretty much what I was showing you here, all right? We're going to talk about these polar ends here, what's, what's occurring there, okay? All right. So the first part is we're going to deal with our sympathetic system. Remember, the sympathetic nervous system is going to govern, all right, blood vessel diameter here, okay? So in this situation, we're going to see a hard vasoconstriction of both the afferent and the efferent arterioles. Up until this point, we were always talking about that first arterial, and now we're going to talk about what happens with the efferent arterial, okay? So in this scenario, you guys remember this, renin, all right? Renin is going to be that chemical substance that is going to be released. We talked about that when we were dealing with our, um, uh, the ACE inhibitors. Remember I was talking about that angiotensinogen and then angiotensinogen converting enzyme, all right? Well, in this situation, renin is going to be converted eventually into angiotensin II, and that is going to cause the mesangial cells, remember those cells I told you that had that contractile component, it's going to stimulate the mesangial cells to contract. And by doing so, it's going to decrease, 
it's going to make those filtration slits smaller significantly. And by doing that, it's going to be harder for things to filter out. All right. And so we will decrease the glomerular filtration rate. And so that means if less stuff is leaving our blood, our blood volume, all right, is maintained or essentially it doesn't decrease. Okay. And that's what we're going to see here. Um, oh, all right. Let me pop into this one. If you guys haven't seen this, I suggest that you, uh, oops, look at these figures here. I love these flow charts. All right. I won't walk you through it exactly, but again, all right, some sort of emergency, there's a situation going on. Sympathetic nervous system is going to stimulate vasoconstriction, all right, of the e, or excuse me, the afferent arterial here. So this decreases, decreases the blood flow here into the glomerulus. At the same time, all right, renin is released, all right, from the juxtaglomerular cells there, all right, and it gets uh, converted into angiotensin II, which is going to cause the mesangial cells to, to contract and decrease the amount of uh, the, the surface area of those filtration slits, and it allows less fluid and substances to leave the glomerulus, thus maintaining, all right, the blood volume in your circulatory system, decreasing urine output, all right, keeping your blood volume consistent to help maintain blood pressure, okay? All right. So how do we increase the GFR? We've got ANF. Where are you? All right. Atrial natriuretic peptide. That is that hormone that's produced in the atria when there's an increased stretch. Well, what causes an increased stretch? Increased blood pressure. All right. So as the blood pressure increases, all right, now we need to lower our blood volume. To do that, we're going to increase the glomerular filtration rate, okay? So we're going to make the diameter of the afferent arterial larger. So we're going to relax the, the afferent arterial. We're going to stop releasing the renin because we don't want to stimulate the mesangial cells. We want to leave them alone. We don't want them contracting. We want them to keep those filtration slips or slips, slits, as big as possible so stuff can flow out of our glomerulus, all right? So we, we cause the relaxation of the mesangial cells, and that increases the filtration membrane surface area, all right? That's going to increase the glomerular filtration rate. That increase in glomerular filtration rate is going to increase the urine volume. We increase the urine volume. Subsequently, we will decrease decrease the blood volume, and decrease the blood pressure. You kind of see that? You see where I'm going with that? And again, if you're not sure, all right, use those figures. I'll come right back to this slide. But these figures here, they tell the story and they keep it simple. And what I love about them is at the bottom, at the bottom here, it tells you the result and the overall effect. So check these out here. I think they're awesome. I'll go back to here. Okay, and it's kind of just, it's a step-by-step -step process in, in, in these situations here, right? How, if we're going to increase or um, the, the, the glomerular filtration rate, what are the steps that we need to take to do so? Okay, so let's leave the glomerulus, let's leave the capsule, all right, the renal capsule there, and let's move into our tubular system now, okay? Because we're going to start to talk about resorption and secretion. Remember those two other processes that occur, right, in our nephrons? Okay, so now we're going to talk about what happens, all right, in the remaining portions of the nephron there, okay? And that involves tubular resorption, all right, and our secretion here, okay? So ideally, all right, there's two uh, transport processes that occur 
in our tubular system. The first one is the paracellular transport. That's easy. All right, that's going to occur between two cells. Okay, so you have two epithelial cells, all right, and that paracellular transport is going to move in between these cells. Okay, from the tubular lumen, all right, back into the blood. Okay, so that's the first one. All right, the other one is transcellular transport. Okay, this type of transport is when we're going to move something across one of the plasma membranes and then again across another. We saw that when we were talking about um, I, uh, uh, thyroxine, th thyroid hormone production. We briefly talked about that. Okay, But here we're going to talk about it in the kidney here. So there's two membranes that we have to go across. The luminal membrane and that's the part of the plasma membrane that's in the lumen of the tubular system. And then the basal lateral membrane, that's the part of the membrane that's going to be closest to the blood vessel. Okay? So really, we're going to see what is going to happen, all right? When we talk about resorption, all right, we're going to see stuff move from, if this is the lumen here, we're going to see stuff from the lumen go into the cell and then eventually from the cell into the blood vessel. All right, that's going to be for resorption. And for secretion, we just reverse it. It goes from the blood vessel back into the epithelial cell and then back into the lumen. Okay? It just depends on what's going on, which way those arrows are going to go. Okay? All right. So when we're talking about transport, all right, across plasma membranes, we have to talk about transport proteins. And there's different types, all right? And you could probably name them, most of them, without even thinking, all right? You're familiar with channels. You're familiar with pumps, all right? But now we're going to throw in here what we call transporters, all right? There's different types of transporters in here, okay? But these transport proteins are going to be found, all right, on both the luminal and the basal lateral membranes, and they're going to influence the movement of these substances in and out of the cell, okay? And so some of the other things besides the transport proteins that are going to influence movement, all right, when we talk about the peritubular capillaries, remember what I was telling you, all right, when we first initially filter that fluid, out of the blood, what's left behind, all right, is blood that has a higher oncotic pressure because all the, that's left behind are going to be the blood-formed elements and lots of those proteins, and the proteins help to contribute, all right, to the oncotic pressure. Well, we filtered out a lot of fluid, so therefore, in the capillaries here, in these peritubular capillaries, we're going to see a low hydrostatic pressure. All right, and again, this is going to, again, influence, all right, resorption, all right, through that process of bulk flow, all right, which deals with hydrostatic pressures and anchotic pressures, and we'll talk about that, all right. So the uh, proximal convoluted tubule, this is the place where we see primarily resorption, okay, and it helps, too, because... All right, the cuboidal epithelium has microvilli. And that microvilli, all right, we know microvilli help to increase surface area. Okay, so now we've increased the surface area. We have all these pumps and transport proteins going on. So we can get a lot of movement of substances, all right, across these membranes here. And we're going to see most of that in the proximal convoluted tubule. All right, it's almost like... All right, we've just formed this, this filtrate. Oh, no, there it goes. It's, most of it's being resorbed back into the capillaries. So it almost seems kind of pointless. But we need that to happen so we can change the oncotic pressure inside the capillaries and the hydrostatic pressure inside the capillaries so we can get a movement of substances. Okay? So here you can see <clears throat> what we're looking at right here in the proximal area. 
All right, so we're looking pretty much right here in the proximal convoluted tubule. So here we've just made our filtrate, all right, and our filtrate now enters into the tubular system. So now it's called tubular fluid, and it moves through the tubular flu uh, 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 system here, okay? Our cuboidal epithelium, you can see here are the microvilli, all right, it is going to be simple, one single layer thick, all right? We will see the movement of certain substances in between, Okay, very small substances will pass directly between the cells. And then in some of these cells, we'll see how some of the substances will enter into the cell on the luminal uh, uh, side and then exit on the basal uh, lateral side here and then enter into our capillaries here. Mind you, the capillaries still have, all right, because we've filtered out a lot of stuff, all right, and a lot of fluid. Okay, the capillaries will have a low hydrostatic pressure. Okay, so things really won't want to leave the capillary. And in fact, the pushing, remember the hydrostatic pressure is that pushing pressure. All right, that's really low right now, but the pulling pressure is quite high. So that's going to promote stuff going back into the capillaries here. Okay. And then eventually as we move through the tubular system here, you'll see all right, how some of the substances will move back from the capillary back into the tubular system, but we'll talk about that. Okay. There we go. All right, so that brings me to the next subject here about the uh, transport maximum and renal threshold. All right. Eventually, we're going to reach a maximum amount of resorption and secretion. Okay, that can occur, okay? Because we just won't have enough equipment to allow us to move things across, all right, uh, our tubular system here, okay? So the maximum rate, all right, that we uh, uh, assign to something, we call that the transport maximum or the TM, okay? And that basically tells us how much of something can be resorbed into the bloodstream or how much of something can be secreted back into the tubular system over a certain period of time. And this is where we like to talk about glucose, right? Now, a lot of it when we're dealing with the transport membrane all right, value has to do with the number of transport proteins that are in the membrane. So if our transport, if, if our rate of resorption is decreased, well, we can increase that. How do we do that? We just put more transport proteins into the plasma membrane. So if we make more transport proteins and stick them into the plasma membrane, we can resorb all right, more material or secrete more material. Okay. So when we're talking about glucose, for example, all right, so all right, you see 375 milligrams all right, of glucose will be filtered out per minute and reabsorbed. Okay back into your bloodstream. If we go past that value of 375 milligrams, okay, we don't have enough transport membrane, or excuse me, proteins to, to, to put into the, into the plasma membrane. We've reached our maximum. So whatever we can't resorb will stay in the tubular fluid, okay, and it'll be excreted in the urine. So that value is 375 milligrams, all right, because we've maxed out our, our transport membrane uh, uh, proteins, okay? We can't put any more in there, okay? So when we talk about the renal threshold, all right, that is going to be, all right, the maximal concentration of the plasma, all right, that can be in the blood all right, before it appears in the urine, okay? So if we exceed this value, our TM, in this case when we're talking about glucose, it's 375 milligrams. If we exceed that val value, all right, then the excess is going to wind up being excreted in the urine, all right? So diabetics, okay? They have poor insulin production or they have insulin resistance on some of their peripheral cells. Point being is, all right, glucose is not being taken out of the blood. It's sitting in the blood and it's circulating. It's not getting into the tissues, okay? 
So our problem is our blood sugar levels are too high, all right, and our transporters can only, all right, resorb 375 milligrams, all right, at a certain, over a certain period of time. So whatever exceeds that winds up going into the urine, okay? So we see that quite often with our, our diabetics. And that leads me to this part right here. I'll finish up on this. All right, with glucosuria, all right, that is sugar in the urine, all right? So keep in mind, this is why one of the symptoms, I said this before, why diabetics have to pee a lot, because as they're having glucose in their urine, glucose is an osmotic diuretic, water being the follower that it is, glucose stays in the urine or in the tubular uh, system, so does water. So now we're going to see folks peeing a lot. And therefore, if you're peeing a lot, it's going to increase your thirst. All right, any questions on that? Quiet, everyone's quiet. I understand, it was a lot, it was a lot, a lot. All right, let's uh, 